The following audio is from Maple City Baptist Church in Chatham, Ontario. For more information about Maple City, please visit us online at maplecitybaptistchurch.com. If you have your Bible this morning, please turn to Matthew chapter 26 this morning. This is Matthew's account of the night in which Christ ordained what we will do this morning, the Lord's Supper. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the New Test covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. As a kid, as I heard these verses, I was always intrigued about the song that was sung when they went out. And I always thought as a kid, boy, it would be great to know what song Jesus sung as he went out from this time to the Mount of Olives. And I had little knowledge that we actually do know the songs that were sung by Jesus Christ as he went out from this supper. They are known as the Egyptian halal, which simply means praise. And these are the hymns of Psalm 113 to Psalm 118. Matter of fact, these psalms were chanted in the temple while the Passover lambs were being slain. These psalms have a strong connection with the Passover feast. Jewish families would gather together, and before the feast began, they would sing Psalm 113 and 114. And as the meal progressed toward the end, after the last cup, they would then sing Psalm 115 through 118. And so this morning as we gather, we don't have to wonder, as children might, what Jesus sang that night before he went out into the Mount of Olives. We know that. Last words are important, right? I don't know if you've had the opportunity to be with people as they gave their last words, but if you're going to give your last words, they're important. We listen, we pay attention. And even more so with this story, I think it's of great importance to understand that not only do we have some of the last words that Jesus sang, But we have them in light of knowing what Jesus knew what was coming. Right? We know that he sang these hymns, but we also know that as the Son of God, he had on numerous occasions predicted his own death. He told the disciples over and over again, and yet they didn't get it. And now it says they sang this hymn, these hymns, and went out to the Mount of Olive. He knew what was coming. He knew when he left, he would then be forsaken by all. He knew that next was the Garden of Gethsemane. That he would become sorrowful unto death, even the death of the cross. That he would, he would be so consumed by what was about to happen that he would sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. From there, he is betrayed by Judas. And interesting enough, he calls him friend. Betrayed by a kiss. He would then go to an illegal trial before the Sanhedrin, where he'd be accused falsely over and over again. From there, delivered to Pilate, where he'd be questioned. He would be beaten. He would be spit upon. He would have someone make a crown of thorns and place it on his head and then take a rod and beat it into his brow. He would be mocked and stripped. Hail, King of the Jews. And then scourged. Beaten. His back looked like a farmer's field. It had been plowed. Mocked, spit upon again. And then led to the cross or he'd be pierced, and the blood would flow. 
And this is what he knew while he was singing these hymns of praise. And so this morning, what I'd like to do as we take time to reflect on this celebration is to keep in mind that Christ, the Son of God, knew what was coming, and yet I want to look at the hymns that he sang before he left that upper room and faced the cross. So turn with me, if you would, at Psalm 113 this morning. And for this first psalm, what I'd like to do is I would like to read this aloud together publicly. It's not a long psalm at all. We can read the nine verses together. We'll just pause when we need to pause at punctuation. But I want you to read this in light of this great halal, these psalms of praise, because Psalm 113 begins by telling us we should praise God, and it'll tell us why to praise God. And I want you to keep in mind that this was the first song that Jesus sang as they got ready for this Passover feast. So, with me, if you would, Psalm 113, starting at verse number 1. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its going down, the Lord's name is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God who dwells on high, who humbles himself to behold the things that are in the heavens and in the earth? He raises the poor out of the dust and lifts the needy out of the ash heap, that he may sit him with princes with the princes of his people. He grants the barren woman a home, like a joyful mother of children. Praise the Lord. This is what he sang. Knowing what was coming, he sings, praise the Lord. And it's interesting what the psalmist does here. He praises the Lord first for his greatness. Praise the Lord. He is great. How is he great? He is great in time, from this time forth and forever. And he's great in space, from the rising of the sun till the going down, from east to west. Praise God for his greatness, for his glory. And the psalmist continues then and says this, not only praise him for his greatness and his glory, but praise him for his goodness. His goodness. This God who dwells on high, this God who reigns, is not remote. He humbles himself. He looks down, and in his goodness, he helps the poor and the needy. And this is the beginning of this great time, these psalms of praise. They are praising the person of God. And here is Christ. On this night, he is still focusing on the greatness and the glory, and the goodness of God. I know that this is tradition. I know this is what they did. I know he grew up like this. But don't you think, in light of what was about to happen, in light of what he knew, he could have easily said, fellas, I just got to opt out of this right now. I'm consumed with what's coming. I know what I'm facing. I know when I leave this place, all that will happen. So I'm just going gonna, gonna to take a break on this. You guys continue, but I'm done. He doesn't do that. He, he chooses in this moment to praise the God of heaven for his greatness and his goodness. I think for us, there might be a great lesson here. Why? Because all of us will suffer. You're going to suffer. You're going to have pain. You're going to have trials. And yet, if we can think of our Savior as he walks through this path, he doesn't become self-consumed. He chooses to focus on the greatness and the goodness of the Father. And may we be encouraged this morning, wherever we find ourselves in our suffering, to take our focus, not on the suffering, but on the Savior. And his greatness and his goodness and the fact that he's going to be glorified in all of this. 
Is this not what Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6? Be careful, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, right? Thanksgiving for what? For God's goodness, for God's greatness, for God's glory. God, I'm struggling. But listen, I'm going to give thanks in everything, in my prayer, in my supplication. And then he goes on to say in verse number 7, that the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep or guard your hearts in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so we begin this evening with our Savior. And what he does is he praises the God of heaven. Psalm 113. Next song. Psalm 114. Psalm 114 is an interesting psalm. Um, Toward the end of it, it becomes very poetic. But listen to the beginning of the psalm. And remember, this is what Jesus now is singing in the upper room with his disciples. When Israel went out of Egypt, the house of Jacob, from a people of strange language. Do you know what the psalmist is talking about here? Do you know what that phrase means as they begin to praise? Do you know what events that the psalmist now is praising God about? Does anyone have a clue this morning of the event he's talking about? The Exodus. The greatest event in Israel's history. The Exodus of God's people. They were slaves in bondage. They were under a a cruel taskmaster. They were servants and slaves. And yet in the Exodus, in one evening, in one night, a nation would be born and these people would be freed. Do you know the means of that Exodus? Do you know how that came about? Do you know what event happened that freed Israel that night? Yeah, it was the Passover lamb. The innocent, pure, spotless lamb of God was slain. The blood was shed. It was placed on the post, on top, and on the sides. And that was the redemption of God's people, Israel. And here is Christ himself singing a hymn of Israel's redemption, knowing that he himself is about to become their Passover lamb. That he now will shed his innocent blood for his people. That he who knew no sin would be made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And by his blood, he would purchase and ransom, and redeem a people. So here he's singing about the glories of the Exodus, knowing that through his body and through his blood, he would purchase and redeem his own. Now look at verse 2 of the text. And look what happens for Judah and Israel. Verse number 2 says, Judah was his sanctuary. The sanctuary is? It's a holy place place where God dwells. Israel's redeemed to be God's holy place. And then it tells us in verse 2, Judah was a sanctuary and Israel his dominion. A place where God rules. Beloved, this morning as we think of this communion table, the consequences for us are the same. We are a purchased people. You have been redeemed. You have been ransomed. You have been paid for. You have been rescued from the marketplace of sin. You know what God says about his people now? That you are his sacred place. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which lives in you? You are not your own. You have been bought with a price. And not only are we his sanctuary, his sacred place, we are to be and live lives where he rules. Not where you rule. Not where I rule. But where he rules. And so, 
this morning as we think of Christ singing about redemption and the exodus and knowing he would redeem his people to be a sanctuary and a place where he would rule and reign. When we touch the bread, when we look at the cup, does that describe our life this morning? Is your life, is my life, do we understand the magnitude that the Spirit of God now lives within us and it is our responsibility as his royal subjects To let him rule. To let him reign. Not my choice. Not my decision. Not my future. Not my plans. Not my wrath. Not my ideas. But his. His. They continue to sing now as they take the last cup. Psalm 115. Verses 1 through 9. Not unto us, O Lord. Not unto us, but unto thy name give glory for thy mercy and for thy true sake. Wherefore should the heathen say, where is now their God? But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. And this next portion is kind of interesting to me because he's, he's going to begin talking about the plight of the lost. The plight of those who do not know Christ. We need to listen here. Because in this room, there are only two people, two types of people. There are those who are sinners who are now saved by grace, and there are those who are sinners who are lost. We're all sinners. I don't care where you come from, what you've done, who you know, how religious you've been, what you do to do good. We are all sinners. And the difference is, Some of us, by his grace, are no longer what we once were. And he says here, this was was our plight. This this was the Christian's plight. And we're not thinking about it this way, but listen to what he says now in verse number four. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. And you say, well, that disqualifies me because I'm not bowing down to some stupid idol of wood or gold or stone. I mean, I'm, I'm past that. Granted. But you know what an idol is? Calvin said that our hearts are idol-making factories. <laughs> because an idol is something I go to for comfort, security, happiness, acceptance. Right? I go to this idol, whatever it is, believing that somehow, some way, this thing that I give my time, my money, my loyalty to, this thing somehow is going to bring me happiness. This is, I've been grasping and searching, and finally, I got this thing is going to finally give me happiness. That is the fountainhead of all idolatry, because here's the truth. This thing, whatever it is, can never bring you happiness. Ever. Whether it's a person, a thing, doesn't matter because there is no true happiness outside of the eternal God who is the fountainhead of all goodness and joy. And did we not all search our whole lives thinking that somehow, some way, this religion or this lifestyle or this stuff would finally do it? And the psalmist goes through and he explains about these idols. Uh, we'll read on, I guess. Look at verse 5. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, and they hear not. Noses they have, they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. They have, for they have feet, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throats. They that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusts in them. Here's a point. Those things are stupid. That, that's what he, there's stupid, and those who worship them are like them. And that was us. And here's the truth about idols. When I'm lonely, that thing I grabbed onto can't hear me. When I'm sick, it can't heal me. When I repent, it cannot absolve my sin. And when I die, 
It cannot save me. It's meaningless. You will never find the longing you're looking for. And every believer in this room can say amen to that. Listen to what the psalm writer said. I love this old hymn. He said, all my life long I had panted for a drink from some cool spring that I hoped would quench the burning of the thirst I felt within. Feeding on the husk around me till my strength was almost gone, longed my soul for something better, only still to hunger on. Well of water ever springing, bread of life so rich and free, untold wealth that never faileth, my Redeemer is to me. Hallelujah, I have found him. Who my soul so long has craved, Jesus satisfies my longing. Through his blood, I now am saved. And that's what we do. We, we come here, we think about that psalm and the plight of the past, and we come to this table knowing that Jesus completely satisfies. Completely satisfies. Psalm 116. Verses 1 through 5. And remember, our Savior is singing these songs. I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications. Because he hath inclined his ear unto me, therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. The sorrows of death come past me, and the pains of hell get hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then call I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord, and righteous, yea, our God is merciful. And this is a great psalm of deliverance. The psalmist says, I'm in trouble. And, and the phrases that he uses there mean any kind of trouble, all trouble. So he cries out and says, God, deliver me. And Jesus is singing this psalm on the night that he will be betrayed, knowing he will not be delivered. That cup will not pass him. He will drink it to the full. It pleased the Father to crush him. And the truth is this morning that because he was forsaken, we were not. Because he was not delivered, but delivered for every one of us, now you and I as believers are free and delivered from our sin and all of our bondage. What a Savior. And the psalmist continues, because the psalmist was delivered, and then he tells us a response to deliverance. In verse number 9, which you don't have on the screen, he talks about, I will walk before the Lord. And then verses 12 through 14, he, he says, what shall I render to the Lord for all of his benefits toward me? He's talking now about public worship, about proclaiming what Christ has done. And when the psalmist understands that he was delivered, and as we understand how we have been delivered, because Christ was delivered for us, we proclaim this morning that we are miserable sinners. The church of Jesus Christ, miserable sinners. We wander, we roam, we're weak, we're needy. I wouldn't put up with me. We are miserable sinners. We have broken God's law over and over again, and all of us have had the sentence of eternal death. Listen, Jesus came not to condemn the world. You know why? The world was condemned already. <laughs> it was already done. When our first parents decided, I will be my own God, they plunged this world into sin, chaos, and disorder. We were sentenced with death. All of us. Not just a real bad guy. Yeah, Hitler, I got it. Mussolini, I got it. Right? Pol Pot, I got it. Those guys. Or the unlovable ones. 
we were asked in our Bible study group, who are the unlovables in the story of Jonah? We heard things like Democrat. Republican. We got our categories, right? Can I tell you something? We're all unlovable. Because we have sinned against a holy, righteous God who is eternal. And the sin against a holy, righteous God who is eternal is eternal death. It is separation in a place called hell forever away from this God. Because he will deal with all sin. He'll deal with yours. He'll deal with mine. And it's going to be dealt with either the wrath of God will be poured upon your head or you'll accept it being poured on the head of the Son and you going free. Those who were sentenced to eternal death are now given eternal life and we have been delivered. And because of that, we should walk before the Lord. We should increase in the grace in our life. Dear beloved, in our churches, this should be a place where grace abounds. Why? Because grace has been shown to all of us. This should be a place where the unlovable and the outcast and the marginalized can come and say, listen, I don't know what all that's going on there, but those people love each other. I mean, really love each other. There's no gossip. There's no hypocrisy. There's, they make mistakes and they get it right, but they love each other. In light of our deliverance, this should be our desire, that brothers and sisters grow in mutual love and service. And that love expands outside of here and here to our neighbors, our friends, and our families. If Christian people would stop and think about our deliverance and think about the love that has been lavished upon us and finally, I mean finally, I'm talking to myself, get a hold of that, it would change our lives. Do you know, you do know, the one thing that Jesus said that men would know that you're my disciples it wasn't the name on the front of the church. It wasn't the Bible that you carry or the dress that you wear. It was something real simple. It was love. It was love. And a delivered people who, by the love of God, should lavish that on others. And so the psalmist does. He understands that, and we should too. Psalm 117. My kids, we always encourage them to have their devotions before they went to bed, always. And at the end of the night, if they realize they didn't have their devotions, this is the psalm they'd always go to. Because there are only two verses. So they say, oh, I did my devotions. Got both verses from Psalm 117. Listen to what it says. Oh, praise the Lord, all ye nations. Praise him, all you people. For his merciful kindness is great toward us. And the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord. And in this small two verses of this chapter, Christ is singing, knowing that his gospel will be pervasive. Do you notice what he says there? He says in verse number one, all nations and all people that the truth of the gospel of Christ, his death and resurrection, would not stay in Jerusalem or Judea or Samaria, but it would go to the uttermost parts of the earth so that all people, all tongues, all tribes, all nations would praise this God who died for them. It is the same God, the same worship, the same reason. Because there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It is the name of Jesus Christ. And today, because of his sacrifice, the psalmist had it right that people from every tongue, tribe, and nation would praise him for his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And Jesus sings this part knowing this is the end. I will have my prize. It reminds me of the great text in Revelation 5, the the throne room scene where they say this, and they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. 
One more song for that night. It's Psalm 118. Listen to this song. And remember, they're almost done now. It's time to leave the upper room. It's time to go to the Mount of Olives. It's time for the whole process now to be set in motion. And here are the first words from Psalm 118. Give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, because his mercy endures forever. And it goes on. It's an interesting psalm. If you look at it, what happens is, for the first part of it, it's almost like an invitation for everyone to to gather together and start walking to the temple and praising God. And if you get toward the end, they're actually going into the temple and praising God. That's how it's set up. So let me read for you verses 20 through 26, reminding you, again, this is what Jesus is singing before he leaves the upper room. And for those of you who have been believers for a while, I think you're going to be amazed at the terminology that's used in this psalm that connects with Christ. Look at verse number 20. This gate of the Lord unto which the righteous shall enter. That's coming into the temple. That's the idea here. I will praise thee, for thou hast heard me and art become my salvation. The stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. That sound vaguely familiar? That's Jesus Christ. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. That what was rejected was a cornerstone. And this redemption was the Lord's doing. And this redemption doesn't make sense for the religious. Because there's nothing I'm doing. It is grace. All grace. This is a day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Listen to me. That's not just any day. That's this day. That's this, this is the day. This marvelous doing. This ransom that is being paid. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. And he's singing. I just want to stop for a second because we're almost done. There are three verses left. Just three. And before we read them, I again want you to remember. This is what Jesus, these are the last stanzas that he sings before he leaves the upper room. Look at verse 27. God is the Lord, which has showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords, even to the horns of the altar. Thou art my God, I will praise thee. Thou art my God, I will exalt thee. O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth. Forever. I wonder what the disciples thought as they looked back on that night and heard Jesus sing, Take the sacrifice and bind it to the altar. Because the sacrifice was bound to the altar, it was a wooden altar on Calvary's brow. And there, our Savior gave his lifeblood for us. Should we not celebrate that this morning? And not just his death, because if it was only his death, we would be miserable. The truth is, three days later, he got up and is alive and well. So we come to the table this morning to remember, to contemplate, to meditate, to praise and rejoice, and a risen Savior. I'll ask the men to join me now for our communion service.